Lormar Distributing Company, 5945, Roosevelt Road, Chicago. A company owned by Chucky English. Tony Accardo and Sam Giancana were thought to have started the firm with their cash investments. Lormar also owned Plaza Records. The company was a record sales and jukebox sales distribution firm that undersold competitors by selling bootleg copies of top recordings. On the hit record, You Can Make It If You Try, recorded in 1957 by Gene Allison, Lormar was thought to have sold 86,000 bogus copies to stores in three months. The pirating was flawless, and even the color and coding from the recording company's label was perfect. In addition to buying records from Lormar, operators were forced to pay $3.60 per jukebox per year in protection money. The messages to Midwest operators was simple, buy from Lormar or die, and most did buy from them. A rival wholesale record firm in one year lost $800,000, or 90% of its trade. In late 1959, the McClellan Committee reported that Chicago jukebox operators had to pay more than $100,000 a year to maintain peace in the industry and keep from losing the locations for their machines. Several operators testified in secret that the reason they fell into line, as they called it, and purchased their record supplies from English's firm was after they saw that profitable jukebox locations were lost by operators who refused to buy from English. A Cicero record shop owner named Smith complained that he was cut when two hoodlums slammed a stack of records into his face after he spurned their demands to buy from Lomar. Some operators said Smith insisted, you go along with Lomar because I can get any stop I want. Bobby Kennedy, a counsel to the McClellan Committee, focused all of his attention on Chucky English, claiming English was behind the entire scam of distributing counterfeit records to jukebox operators at cut-rate prices. English, Kennedy said, began distributing counterfeit records after intimidating jukebox operators into buying its records for five cents a piece above the price charged by other distributors. The pressure put on the operators included threats that they would be picketed by the coin machine division of Local 134 of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. State's attorney's police raided the Lormar Distributing Company, charged English with selling more than 125,000 counterfeit records in one six-month period. State's attorney Benjamin S. Adamowski accused Joey Glemko, taxi union boss, of applying union pressure on the operators. Adamowski said the mob's target was to control 8,500 Chicago operators. The state of Illinois also referred charges because, remarkably, English was charging a 5% fee to cover state taxes, which he of course pocketed. In retaliation, Bobby Kennedy called Glemko before the committee in Washington, D.C. At the time, Glemko owned Local 777 of the Chicago Cab Driver Union, a large and powerful cab union that could, conceivably, close down Chicago should it go on strike. Glemko took the Fifth Amendment rights 152 times. Kennedy also ordered Glemko to bring Local 777's books with him, which he did, but insisted that he had a sworn obligation to keep the books in his sight at all times. To Glimco's surprise, Robert Kennedy agreed, telling the hood, as you realize we'll want to keep these records overnight, I have arranged a bed for you to sleep on, and the men's rooms is halfway down the corridor. There is also a cafeteria in the building so that you will be able to eat breakfast here as well. When Kennedy returned an hour later, Glimco was gone. During the hearings, Kennedy called in several dozen Chicago Fulton Street Market operators who had complained that they were forced to pay tribute to Glimco under fear of death. Under oath, all of them admitted paying Glimco, but said they gave him money because they just liked him as a person. When a case against Glimco was brought to trial, Glimco took $124,000 from the taxicab Teamster Union Fund to pay his legal expenses. Sensing that the end was near for Glimco, in 1962, Sam Giancana, who never liked Glimco, moved in on his unions and slowly took them over. Afterwards, he reduced Glimco's rank in the organization. During all of this, the mob then decided to create its own singing sensation and introduced crooner Tommy Leonetti as their favorite and demanded that distributors fill their jukeboxes with his records. When one Chicago distributor named Ted Sapura refused, saying, it isn't good enough to get on the boxes. One of the hoods showed him a bullet and said these things can be dangerous. They penetrate flesh. Soon afterward, said Sapura, he began getting calls for the Leonetti record from operators who had heard the same sales pitch. When Sapura told his story to the McClellan Crime Committee, NBC dropped Leonetti from its dance show American Bandstand. However, he was picked up by the Arthur Godfrey show, which wrongly assumed they were getting a trio called Tommy, Lee, and Eddie. When Sam Giancana was attending a wedding reception at a downtown hotel and noticed the entertainment singer Jane Darwin and recommended her to Sam and Chucky English who intended to make her a star by puffing up her record sales. 
At the time, George Vidra, a Berwyn alderman, was guiding Darwin's career. Vidra was known to the police as an associate of the English brothers. The 42-year-old Vidra was found dead in the cab of a truck parked in a garage at the rear of a family-owned butcher shop at 1604 Southeast Avenue, Berwyn. The autopsy report said that Vidra had died of carbon monoxide poisoning and acute alcoholism. The coroner added that Vidra's blood contained twice the amount of carbon monoxide that is necessary to kill and just enough alcohol to cause death. A handwritten suicide note found in Vidra's pockets mentioned Darwin and told of having thrown away $50,000 on her. It was all too suspicious and the coroner called together an inquest and questioned the English brothers, who admitted they had known Vidra for at least a decade but denied strong-arming him to giving up Darwin's contract. Then Charles Siragusa, executive director of the Illinois Crime Investigating Commission, looked into the matter and determined that George Vidra was most likely murdered. Jane Darwin said that Vidra had phoned her Thursday night, sounded depressed, and had been so since the death of his wife, Ruth, two years ago and that Vidra had frequently complained of pain from a malignancy in his stomach. She also testified she had failed to exercise an option to renew a three-year contract with him as her manager because of his depression and increased drinking. She denied that she had received $50,000 from him, as indicated in the four-page suicide note found on the alderman's body. Investigators found that Vidra's abdominal cancer had been terminated surgically several years before he knew the singer and that therefore, a malignancy would not have been a reason for taking his life. It was also noted that the handwriting on the suicide note wasn't written in Vidra's handwriting. He was in good spirits the night before he died and had set up a breakfast meeting with a friend. Berwyn police and firemen testified that they smelled no fumes in the garage, that the truck engine was cold, and the ignition key turned off, and Vidra's body and clothing were wet with perspiration even though the truck engine was cold. Berwyn police noted in their final report that it could not be explained how the engine could have become cold while the body remained soaked with perspiration. Privately, several officers told the investigators that they believed that Vidra may have been loaded with drinks, then placed in a car with its engine motor running elsewhere than in the garage, and then his body dumped in the parked truck. They also noted rumors that Vidra's heavy debts may have driven him to mob loan sharks. Neither police nor firemen could recall seeing what appeared to be a piece of white cloth jammed between Vidra's hand and mouth in a photo taken at the death scene. Jane Darwin said that she had been a partner with Vidra and his late wife in a record recording venture and that there were no other partners but police indicated Sam English was a partner in the business. Chucky and Sam English weren't harmed in the record scandal, in fact they made enough money from it to buy the Rim Rock Ranch near Phoenix, Arizona, a dude ranch, in 1965, for about $300,000. Shortly afterward they flipped the property for just under $1 million. The furniture in the ranch building was leased by the Cook County government. Sam English, who had a history of heart problems, died in 1973 at age 61.